Let's stay on the markets, talk a little bit about everything uh, that's happening here as we set up for the end of the second quarter. Jamie Cox joins us now. He's a managing partner over at Harris Financial Group. So, Jamie, let's just start with something that you mentioned in your note to us. That the market's been rehearsing a taper tantrum, and it, it comes to this idea that we've discussed here a lot, which is that the market is, in some ways, just going through the steps that we all learned after the financial crisis, right? The Fed certainly doesn't want there to be a taper tantrum, but everyone says, well, 2013, here's how it all went. So maybe we'll, we'll replay it that way. Um, how are you thinking about some of those dynamics where, uh, again, we have a lot of very similar setups from the way markets behaved out of the last recovery? Well, as typical, you know, we take our cues from the past, but in this particular situation, the circumstances couldn't be more different. You had deleveraging and you had all kinds of terrible things that were happening during the financial crisis, whereas you just had an artificially in induced slumber with COVID. So you have a completely different setup here. So the the, the idea of there, there that there's going to be some type of you know crazy level of inflation is just not founded in fact. In fact, I think that most if you look at the uh, if you look at most of the data that are coming out, you see all the setups for the transitory argument. And markets are just ignoring it. They're basically saying, no, the Fed's wrong. And therefore, every time that, market, that interest rates move, even, even in the slightest, we're going to start to see sell-off in major stocks, consumer you know, discretionary and in technology. And it's unfor and fortunately for all of us that are paying close attention to the data, it's, that's not really what's playing out. We're seeing very, very clear signs of the transitory component and, and the Fed being patient and also being right in this case, which is actually good for markets. And I think markets are starting to come around to the Fed's way of thinking. And we're probably looking for another quarter or so for the supply constraints and things like that to feed through. But what's going to end up happening is that once that supply level constraint starts to wane, we're going to go into a period of disinflation. And then then you're going to really be happy that interest rates haven't been going up that much because we're going to have the opposite effect probably you know, later in the year and early into 2022. So the Fed is being smart, smart and responsible, thankfully, and not raising rates in response to what the market thinks and paying attention to the actual data. There, so the uh, opening bell on Wall Street to kick off this week, Beachbody, ringing that opening bell. I'm just surfing around their website right now. They sell uh, my type of stuff, uh, fitness shakes, and uh, it looks like energy drinks and nutrition programs. Definitely a potential size trade there. Jamie, do you, um, you know, if we get a good jobs report uh, this coming Friday, let's say over 750,000 on the headline. I, I did see estimates close to 1 million, some estimates, but let's say we do get 750,000, somewhat in line with consensus. Where does the market go? I, I still think the market travels higher. I, I think that the pent up demand in consumption is being heavily underestimated by you know markets. And, and I, I feel like markets basically are, are paying attention to the wrong things or paying attention to labor markets and things like that that are slow to get going. And instead of paying attention to the bigger picture, which is the vaccine rollout is going better than expected. And, and therefore, the time and duration of the stimulus is actually pushing forward demand a lot faster than what people anticipate. And I think that's where you're going to see markets probably underpricing stocks as we go towards the latter part of the year. So um, I know a lot of people feel like things are fairly valued or even maybe a little stretched in some cases. But I, I believe if you take cues from Israel, China, other places where they got the, the COVID circumstance under control, I think it's very simple to say that markets are probably underestimating what the potential pent up demand and the, you know, unlike the financial crisis where people were deleveraging, now people are very, very flush with cash. And that deployed that deployable cash is really going to translate into mega economic activity, and it doesn't look like it's going to start from a stop with government spending either. We've got a decent, you know, chance of getting some type of infrastructure spending that will go along with it. So, the stimulus keeps rolling, and unlike the financial crisis where you had literally the Fed carrying the water by itself, you have a double barrel, you know, circumstance here where you have both fiscal and monetary policy sort of it with winds at your back. And that's a little bit different and markets haven't really seen that in quite some time. It's probably not since 2000, 2001, when you saw both fiscal and monetary stimulus be you know, working in concert one with another. And so I think that's the type of cue pe people should be taking when they're making their allocation decisions for the balance of 2021 going into 2022.
and then just in terms of style, I mean, you know, you're still talking here about uh, the setup for, for value plays, which has had um, or they have they have had a great run over the last nine months or so. Um, what are you seeing in, in those kinds of names that that still keeps you you know with conviction that that's a place uh, to be, as we've seen maybe a, a little bit over the last few weeks, a little bit of a favor uh, towards some some growthier type names? Yeah, I think in the U.S. it's probably going to be balanced from here on out because interest rates aren't going to be the factor that they were, you know, for the for the first half of 2021. But I think what you're going to see is that international value is going to be where it's at in terms of the value trade for the back half of the year 2021, in in large measure because it's it's those indices, you know, MSCI, et cetera, the FTSE, they're chock full of value stocks, and as those economies sort of get their COVID circumstances under control and open up, you'll probably see the template repeat where, you know, here in the U.S., you'll see some recoveries in those most heavily um, influenced names by the pandemic. So I think that's where it's going to be. It's not necessarily here. I think that the value trade here in the U.S. is probably where it needs to be and balance needs to be taken from here. I don't I don't think that you'll be able to basically just pick a value index and, and do as well going forward. It's going to be much more balanced. And in fact, personally, I think that, you know, when we're talking about macro and trying to figure out what to do for investing for the future, you had a, a you mentioned in your segment before this one about CRISPR and some other of those biotechnology companies. That's where the decade of this decade is going to be marked as the biology decade. We're going to see so many advances that have been brought, you know, brought forward by the pandemic and all the R&D that was deployed. We're going to be seeing things that we have never you know, considered based on genomics therapy, based on liquid biopsies from Illumina. I mean, it's this is going to be quite quite the decade for you know, healthcare and things like that. So the setups maybe for pharma are probably really, really good. And so if that's a sector that I would suggest people pay very close attention to when they're making their allocation choices, because it's just it's going to be a there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs and we're going to see lots of different um, companies, you know, with, with some blockbuster drugs like the Lipitor's of the world or whatever that will be, you know, multi multi year revenue generators for companies. And it's just around the corner, probably a couple of years from now, we're going to see some cures or some things we hadn't thought possible. And it'll all be brought about because of the pandemic putting so much emphasis and focus on new and novel technologies to, you know, try to solve a global problem. Jamie, I was I was patiently waiting for your Cardi B pregnancy stock tips. <laughs> I think FedEx, you know, I, I don't know if it necessarily does. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. I was actually going to ask you about Bitcoin. I, I won't make a comment <laughs> on that, but but Bitcoin, are you getting any interest in Bitcoin? We'll, we'll leave Cardi B for another discussion. So uh, in my in my role, uh, as a financial advisor, I talk about it a lot, um, but I don't recommend it because I'm not allowed to. But I do believe that the platform on which cryptocurrencies, the blockchain and things like that have a lot of potential. But as far as something that I can talk about or recommend, it's not, you know, in my wheelhouse at this point. Well, and I guess, you know, just to follow up on that, Jamie, are you guys, I mean, how do you talk about that internally then where you would get to a place on that? And, and what do you tell someone if, if they come to you and say, I want to buy this, I mean, you have to be like, oh, you can do that on your own time, but there's nothing that, you know, there's no way that I, as a financial advisor, can make sense of it in a way that I feel, you know, kind of responsible outlining for you. Yeah, I have my opinions on on on, on the cryptocurrencies and also, also, also the assets. But as far as making recommendations, I do it just like I would any other, you know, non-correlated asset. You know, if you want to own it, you need to make sure it fits within your allocation. So in much the same way that people used to buy gold, that's sort of by the wayside at the moment, a few percentage, you know, points of your allocation to something that's a little bit esoteric that won't hurt you if you're wrong is perfectly fine. And if it as it becomes more mainstream and you become more familiar with it, then it doesn't hurt you to continue to, you know, build the allocations over time. So that's how most people should approach it. And in that way, I would say that the average consumer, the average consumer of financial advice that are clients of ours, don't really understand the, the, the technology behind the blockchain or understand what a cryptocurrency actually represents. So as a consequence, they're sort of at a disadvantage to people who do. So, you know, it's OK to try it and learn on the fly, but you don't want to do it with large amounts of your, of your nest egg or your net worth. So that's how you would approach any new, whether it was biotech stocks where you're trying to 
you know, hit the lottery or whatever on one of them for a technology. You approach it with the same attitude. And if you're right, fantastic. If you're not, it's no harm done. All right. Jamie Cox, managing partner at Harris Financial Group. Jamie, uh, thanks so much for jumping on this morning. Appreciate the time and we'll talk soon. Let's just start with what Tokyo might look like. I mean, you you know went to uh, several games and, and it's a fun experience down there, but I, I don't does not seem like Tokyo is going to be uh, maybe the quasi party that, you know, Rio or some of these others turned out to be. Well, I've been hearing a lot of news about Tokyo and the, um, the population of Japan signed petitions like 6% saying they don't want to host the Olympics and so forth. So I'm kind of, so I really have no idea what's going to happen. But um, my choice not to compete was a personal choice. And as you think about, you know, competition and the way that the sport has changed, um, I mean, let's start with the equipment. I mean, we've seen it, especially on the distance side, you know, where where you know, I maybe I'll follow things more closely. The 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 gear that people are using are, are changing the results now. Um, does it feel to you like some of that has gone too far, and that the amount of time we're seeing shaved off, uh, you know, good athletes, but but the times that are being turned in in this footwear is starting to generate a conversation around maybe maybe this isn't the real spirit of competition. Well, technology has definitely um, got into the way, because I realized like in the 100 meter final or the hurdles, a lot of false starts, the, the, um, the blocks have been mal malfunctioning. And, but we need to rely on um, human instinct and, and your own eyes to see what's going on. Um, but track and field is definitely, it's up in limbo. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen as far as Nike is concerned or the Olympics. Um, there's a lot of changes that's happening. And, you know, the sport of track specifically, I mean, it's in many ways, it, it is a sport that exists because of, of Nike's involvement. And um, as you reflect on your time, you know, as a professional athlete, you know, as a multiple U.S. champion, as a Nike athlete, are they healthy for for track? Um, if we think about how the sport can continue to be, you know, such a robust part of the collegiate experience and, and be a professional sport over the next, you know, 10 or 20 years. Is, is Nike keeping the sport in a good place in your estimation? That's a very good question. You know, Nike has been in track and field for a very long time. They signed a huge deal with USATF, USA Track and Field. Um, and that, it's kind of weird because it's like, we only have one pretty much sponsorship, like USATF is sponsored by Nike. And it's like, when you look at the track, that's all that you see is the swoosh on every athlete. Of course, there's Adidas, there's New Balance and so forth, but Nike, has dominated um, the sport. Um, they make billions of dollars, you know, um, each year. Um, so it is definitely a monopoly. Um, so we don't know the future of the sport and because there's a lot of internal changes that's happening in Nike right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And I guess as you reflect, you know, on your time um, as an athlete on the circuit, right? Everyone does the same thing. You do some spring meets here, but it's mostly over over in Europe, and you're on your own. You're an individual. You know, it's just it's yeah. just Karen Clement out there on the track. I mean, do you? There was the I guess what, it was maybe three four years ago, right? They tried to do like a team series track series here in the U.S. I mean, do you think more of those kinds of events can find an audience as we see smaller sports? I mean, the, F1 phenomenon has been amazing to, to see in the U.S. Is there a way to monetize the sport of track, which, you know, again, as you know, it's the most participated in sport for high school students, but, you know, kids run track and then they just move on. And it, it feels to me as a former athlete, and I guess you feel the same way, like it should be a bigger deal, you know, at the, at the professional ranks. Well, um, I will say, like, as far as on the lower level, as far as junior Olympics, the kids, um, high schoolers, there's a huge audience for high school and even collegiate level, but I think that there is a, a gap between you know ju the junior level and the professional level. Um, and it's just really hard to, to bridge the gap because track is such an individual sport. Like you have to fend for yourself, you have to travel to competitions. Um, most uh, meets meet directors, they don't pay for your way. 
or to give you half the, the travel money. So you have to fend for your, your, yourself. And most athletes, they, they, the contract is, is, is less than, let's say, $12,000. You know, so it's like, how can you survive on that much money when you have to pay for your own way, pay for tickets to go overseas? And it's very expensive, you know, and it's like you're getting pennies next to nothing um, to compete. So it's like, what is the point? Financially for me, it was not a, a best decision for me to compete this, this year because as I'm older, I'm worth more, you know. Um, I've been in the sport for over 14 years, and I feel like my my, my leg is, is worth more, like, and I, you know. And that's how I should carry myself at the highest level. Because Beyonce, for example, would not, you know, comp- you know, perform at Coachella if she don't have a contract, right. you know. So, <laughs> so I have to hold myself at that standard as well. Yeah, and it's like. Well... Why is a six-time gold medalist uh, feel like they can't get you know the support that they that they need to co- to compete at the highest level? I mean, it certainly you know speaks to to a problem that the sport has. But um, you know, Karen, just switching gears a little bit before um, we let you go. You know, we are wrapping up uh, Pride Month here in the U.S. Um, and a couple of years ago, you came out. You were not out when you were a professional athlete. And I'm curious what outreach you've had from you know maybe current athletes, um, whether it's in track or other sports. Uh, we just saw Carl Nassib in the NFL last week come out, and I always felt like track and field was such a melting pot and such a perfect sport for an out athlete to be supported. But you know, I guess you didn't feel that way when you were competing. And, and how much are you hoping you know the world is changing now? Um, you know, as we as we certainly a- awaken to some of these issues as a society. Well, you know, I think a lot of athletes is coming in, into themselves. They they are believing in themselves and saying, you know what, I am who I am. I'm not afraid to show my emotions to my friends or family. And for me, like, I reach a point where it's like, I'm tired of hiding um, who I am. And I wanted to live my life freely. And that's the reason why I came out and told my story because other kids um, could view my story as a motivation to, to continue to compete and to have that motivation because I didn't have that motivation growing up because I was closeted. You know, my teammates teased me in college and I wanted to transfer when I was in college. Um, but my friend told me, Carol, you just go out there and can compete and, um, and and just be the best. And that's what I did. I broke a world record. I won gold medals. Um, I didn't allow it to affect me. And it's good to see that football players now it, it, is coming in, into themselves and, and being able to speak their, their, their th- truth. All right, uh, Karen Clement, uh, six-time international gold medalist, two-time Olympic gold medalist, uh, winner of the 400 hurdles uh, in Rio. Uh, Karen, I know you and I will be watching uh, Rye Benjamin in a couple of weeks, see how uh, that young man fares. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us this morning. Uh, great conversation. Self-driving truck. Startup Embark, embarking on a new chapter on the company's five-year history, announcing a $5.2 billion SPAC deal. For more on the announcement, let's bring in Alex Rodriguez, Embark co-founder and CEO. Alex, good to have you back on the show again. You know, a lot of investors looking at this saying, well, we've already got plus and too simple coming to the markets in a similar way. Um, What's your pitch to investors about why they should put their money behind Embark? Yeah, I think Embark is a really different story. I mean, if I had to to pick a couple of things, uh, obviously, uh, as a company that's solely focused on the American market, uh, Embark sits as maybe the the Cisco to the Plus and Two Simples Huawei, and we think uh, we think that's a better position uh, as a software player that's not trying to develop uh, a whole truck, but instead partnering with some of those leading players. Uh, we think what we have is a lot more scalable, and uh, this is ultimately. Uh, people sort of remember the order that companies uh, told the story to the public market. But if you look at the order that people have been working on this problem, uh, Embark's been at this a lot longer uh, than our competition. And I think that reflects in, in how mature uh, the company and the technology actually is. Yeah, which is pretty wild, uh, given, you know, you're just 25 years old uh, and this is a big deal here. Um, but, you know. They say it, it doesn't. You don't need to be an old guy to, to make some pretty big moves here. Uh, and when you look at it, this deal is going to give you about six hundred and fifteen dollars in cash proceeds uh, in the deal. So I mean, when you talk about building out what Embark's working on, how big of a boost is that, and where's the money going to go here? 
Yeah, six hundred fifteen million dollars. It was six hundred fifteen. It wouldn't be a very good spec deal. <laughs> um, but no, we're really excited about it. Uh, we see this uh, funding embark all the way through to commercialization of the technology. It's one of the reasons um, that I was excited to pursue this path for the company because it gives us uh, the ability to have all the money we need to execute in the bank and to be able to really focus on uh, taking the working technology we have today and turning it into a commercial product. Uh, that our carrier partners can be rolling out in their fleets in 2024. When you talk about commercialization of the product, um, what's the timeline right now, and how big is that market that you see? Yeah, this is an absolutely massive market. It's uh, $700 billion a year is what uh, is what companies spend moving freight. Uh, and when you look at the impact, it's really impacting almost every industry because uh, trucking is just a key input. And so when we look at the potential impact that this has across the economy, actually, uh, the Department of Transportation did a study uh, earlier this year that estimated self-driving trucks will lead to an average wage increase for every American worker of $200 per year. Uh, and so this is a huge impact, uh, not just in, in the trucking industry, but uh, everywhere else. And we expect uh, the first scale deployments of this to be happening in 2024. Yeah, the comparison to the other companies working on it, too, with their, uh, I guess, attachment to China is interesting because you also added former Transporta uh, Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao to your guys' board. Uh, and increasingly, when we're dealing with technologies like this, we've seen a lot of companies come out and saying, look, we don't want to deal with China. We're never going to deal with China. We don't want our technology to be used or perhaps maybe even potentially stolen over there. So when you're talking about your positioning at Embark kind of being not that uh, how important is that when it comes to maybe the security concerns around what you guys are working on and how it could benefit the company if you were to say, you know, we're going to distinguish ourselves uh, by not working with China potentially? Yeah, I think um, something that perhaps isn't obvious to people is that this is uh, an industry with huge national security implications, right? Uh, we're talking about literally almost everything from food uh, to, to fuel uh, to, to durable goods, everything's moving on a truck. Uh, and all of the data about where all of the goods are moving and where they're coming from and to, that's all being captured by, uh, by trucking companies. And so it's, it's definitely a critical industry. Uh, and while I don't think we're going to rule out uh, potential, potential avenues down the road, we do believe that uh, by being a U.S. company and focusing on the U.S. market, uh, that that's something that, that's going to serve us well. Alex, obviously, you're still in the process of trying to scale up things and really build out your technology. But we've seen a lot of traditional car makers sort of flag concerns around supply chains and not being able to meet the deadlines that they've set out. Um, what does that look like for you and how big of a headwind has that been? Yeah, we haven't seen uh, too much of an impact, certainly on the, the, the chip side. Uh, and that's partly because of Embark's focus on software. Uh, and so our focus has really been on developing uh, leading software platform, and we haven't seen that uh, at least yet impacting our ability to to test the trucks, to move freight for our customers uh, today. Okay, Alex Rodriguez, good to have you back on again today. Embark co-founder and CEO. Well, supply chain snags are threatening to derail some July 4th celebrations this weekend. A backlog at some of the U.S. ports leading to a shortage of fireworks just days before the holiday celebrations. Let's bring in Stephen Pelkey, Atlas Pyro Vision Entertainment CEO and Artistic Director. Uh, Stephen, there's a lot of people who are concerned because remember last year, all the celebrations were canceled. This is supposed to be sort of the, the big bounce back in terms of July 4th celebrations. What are you seeing in terms of supply and what's the key disruption that's leading to um, the limited supply? Yeah, I mean, there is a shortage on a variety of levels, like everybody we have heard uh, in the news. Uh, 2020, the fireworks industry experienced a record increase in consumer fireworks sales, nearly doubling from $900 billion in 2019 to $1.8 billion in 2020. So naturally, you're going to have a disruption of having a lot of those companies try to resupply at those levels. With the continuing ongoing global shutdown and having probably only about 70 percent of the ships in operation, uh, the ports just aren't able to handle it because globally you just don't have a lot of this infrastructure that is 
completely back in service. So whether you have shutdowns of factories inside China, whether you have uh, increased cost in shipping, which is now matching anywhere between 250 and 300% increases. So you have additional companies that even if they are able to ship fireworks, they're either waiting on a ship outside the port or they've decided not to bring in all of their inventory because they don't want to pay the high cost of shipping uh, due to the port delays and high shipping costs. Yeah, I wonder how much that's going to do to, to pricing. Obviously, we saw kind of some weird dynamics play out last year when we saw a lot of those shows, as Akik was mentioning, get shut down. So maybe some of those fireworks, uh, aside from the ones that you need a license to handle there, made its way to the retail segment. But uh, I'm curious what all of these concerns and kind of congestion might do to prices uh, when it comes to this year's uh, 4th of July. You bring up a great point. And, you know, the consumer industry really didn't have any competition for in the fireworks industry when uh, you have the sector of the professional display industry that still had all of their stock. So they weren't really placing a demand in shipping in 2021, later in 2020 or 2021, because they haven't used their stock. Now that all those displays are coming back, now those consumer companies are going to have to compete with space for professional display companies looking to resupply. So those, most of us are in good shape. Uh, there are going to be some problems with popular items that the consumers may want. The only way to get around that is if you're going to need fireworks for the 4th of July, buy it early. If you're going to need fireworks in uh, August or September, buy it now um, because you there may not be those items or even... Um, uh, any of the particular items that you're really interested in. And then after that, it's really the worry is 2022 um, hmm. as because this is really going to take about, you know, eight to 12 months to really work itself out to correct these port congestions and rail service congestion. So it sounds like you're saying sort of the, the traditional celebrations that we've seen on a bigger scale, the professional ones that you point to, um, that's going to pretty much go off this weekend is planned. What about on a consumer level, these individual stands that we see, is there likely to be a shortage there? Yeah, the individual stands are going to be hardest hit because a lot of the major suppliers of consumer fireworks are handling a lot of their needs. Um, and naturally, there's going to be uh, you know, some reluctance to supply the smaller vendors uh, because there just isn't enough to go around. So many of them have already experienced some of that. And then in addition, as you mentioned earlier, you have you know anywhere between a 5 to 8% increase in, in raw material costs. So the, the average uh, cost has gone up, uh, FOB from China, 5 to 8%. Plus you have a 200 to 300% increase in shipping. So what used to only cost perhaps $10,000 to import a container from China now is getting anywhere between $25,000 and $30,000. That's a pretty tough number when you're trying to bring in a, a total value in a container of $45,000 or $50,000. Um, that's nearly just over half the cost of the uh, container. So you get a, most retailers, most professional uh, display companies are trying to spread it out over all of their product lines because there are going to be some commodities that just can't absorb a 50 to 60 percent increase. So you're going to see price increases anywhere between 15 and 20 percent. And that's going to be the norm over the next couple of years. Yeah, it's been interesting to watch kind of uh, fireworks come and go uh, over the last uh, few months here in the pandemic. But uh, very interesting dynamics playing out. Appreciate you hopping on here to chat it all with us. Stephen Pelkey, uh, Atlas, Pyrovision Entertainment CEO and Artistic Director. Thanks again for the time. Welcome back. IBM has just landed hybrid cloud deals with Verizon, our parent company, and Telefonica of Spain as it aims to build out 5G and edge networks. Here to talk about it exclusively on Yahoo Finance is Howard Beauville, Senior Vice President of IBM Hybrid Cloud Platform. Howard, it's good to have you on the show again. I know that the, these partnerships were announced today by your CEO, Arvind Krishna, during Mobile World Congress's keynote speech. I know that you already work with Verizon when it comes to 5G. So how does this partnership build on that? Both companies continue to innovate. So Verizon around the technology landscape with the fixed line and the mobile assets that you have as a company. And then what IBM brings to that is the ability to run applications at the edge in a secure fashion. 
but also allow the actual pace of innovation to run at its quickest because of building these um, capabilities on Red Hat OpenShift, which is an open source platform that allows a large multi-million developer community to develop against it. Now, Howard, I know that you're touching on it just a little bit, but for those at home that don't fully understand really how this technology works, uh, how is this a game changer really using the cloud on these 5G networks, at least in terms of performance and speed? So 5G is a real game changer that Verizon is bringing into the marketplace. There's, as you mentioned, four speed uh, allows things such as gaming, things taking place in factories from uh, the internet of things and so on and so forth. But the applications that run need to run on a, a, a capability and that's what IBM brings to the partnership. And with Red Hat OpenShift, we bring um, an open platform of which, as I say, many millions of developers can develop against that, which then consumers of that can actually benefit from those innovations. Many exciting things, which we can imagine now in terms of gaming, but many new things that will develop over the coming months and years. And Howard, I know something else that was announced today is these telcos are now going to be able to access AI-powered automation software through something called IBM's Cloud Pack for Network Automation. Tell us a little bit about this and what will they be able to do with that, with that tool in their toolbox? So artificial intelligence is at the heart of our strategy, but essentially what we're always trying to do with artificial intelligence is to make a consumer's experience as frictionless and convenient. So all of the technology components, all of these buzzwords that we use can sometimes be a little bit bewildering and difficult to put together. But what we do with the AI is actually make the experience easier. And in the case of um, cloud packs for network automation, we can reduce the automation time by a factor of six. So it means that you can actually use the capability far more quickly than what you would ordinarily. Therefore creating this frictionless and convenient experience that we look to put into every customer environment that we operate within. Now, Howard, IBM is not the only, sorry about that, Alexis, uh, but IBM I know is not the only uh, company in this space. There's Amazon, there's Microsoft that are also trying to jump in uh, into 5G. What is IBM doing to really stay ahead of its competitors? It's the pace of innovation that we get because of the actual philosophy that we have as a company. Um, so other companies take a proprietary approach. It'll be their developers that develop things at their pace and against their actual capabilities. The philosophy that IBM has is very different. So we build upon open source based technologies, which means that in the case of um, the Red Hat OpenShift capabilities, we have 8 million developers developing against that platform. Of clearly not IBM employers, so all those different points of innovation coming from lots of different minds against the platform. We'll also integrate into other different areas as well, which puts a far greater ecosystem which means we can also draw upon innovation from other partners as well, not just the partnership that we've announced here. So we feel that the platform that we build gives a much quicker pace for innovation and a far better frictionless and more convenient experience for our customers. Can you give us a feel for what some of these real life use cases are? I mean, how might this affect my everyday life, the, the ability for, for companies that I use, especially the telcos, to be able to make my interactions with companies uh, a little more heightened, if you will, by using AI? Yeah, telcos are really at the heart of the next wave of technology innovation, where everything actually has a device that's been monitored and gives you these easier experiences, whether it's your actual driverless cars, whether it's actually um, uh, manufacturing capabilities that are automated to actually give and augmented work to the actual workers in those factories to remove the drudgery and get to the higher value tasks for them. Network carriers such as Verizon will actually be leading that way with 5G based technology and partnerships like the one that we have with IBM to add intelligence at the edge. Um, so there's a range of different innovations that I talked about there, but many more Alexis that will come down the pike um, in short order against that pace of innovation with all the developers that I've talked about. I know that you have about 30 partners right now in your ecosystem. Can you give us a feel for what might be happening with IBM and, and cloud platform in the rest of, for the rest of the year and into early next year? Yeah, so we have, um, I think it's 40 now um, ecosystem partners for the telecommunications side. Um, that's been increasing at a rate of knots and we'd expect to continue to see that throughout the course of the year. Why is that important? It's imp important because not all ideas can be generated with one, within one company. And therefore, you can capture those points of ideas across this broader ecosystem. It can create a platform that gives a much greater and richer experience for our customers, such as yourselves, but also value for the actual ecosystem of partners that sit on this open platform. 
All right, Howard Beauville, Senior VP, IBM Hybrid Cloud Platform. Always good to see you. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. As the adoption of electric vehicles rises, so is the demand for EV charging stations. Consider this, the global EV charging station market is expected to top $100 billion by 2027. One company looking to get a piece of that pie is ChargePoint, which has a number of charging stations throughout the US, Canada, and Europe. Joining us now is the CEO of ChargePoint, Pasquale Romano. By the way, Pasquale joins us as part of our series looking at the future of electric vehicles sponsored by BMW. Pasquale, it's good to have you here on the show. I wanna start with something um, coming out of the White House, that Biden has earmarked $15 billion to build a national network of charging stations. And I'd love to know if ChargePoint has been in touch with the White House. Are you part of that plan at all? Uh, yeah, the White House has, uh, I think, been very thoughtful about uh, reaching out to stakeholders in the electric vehicle industry at large and, and, and to try to really understand um, what, from an infrastructure perspective, is really needed? How is electric fueling different than fueling a gasoline car? And where is incentive really needed? So, Pasquale, to that point, how are you guys envisioning building out a, a charging station network around the country? Because to your point, when, when you are driving a, a, a gasoline powered car, if I run out of gas, I pull into the nearest gas station five, 10 minutes later, I, I'm fueled up and I'm ready to go. But I, I don't see myself on a trip wanting to completely, you know, charge a battery for an hour if I'm already on the road. Um, and I know that charging sometimes at home can be quite expensive. There's a lot of equipment involved. So what would that infrastructure around the nation really look like? Well, well first of all, driving on electricity is uh, significantly cheaper than driving on gasoline. Uh, and let's, let's take those use cases that you, that you used in your example. At home, uh, the, uh, the cost of electricity, which can be acquired while you're asleep, which is a lot better than going to the gas station. You're not going to go to the gas station much or a charging station much um, outside of when you're parked normally at home, at work, and around town. That energy that's coming in is significantly cheaper than driving on gasoline. Net of even the equipment costs, and the equipment costs just aren't that high in installing a charging station uh, in your house or your apartment or condominium. Uh, workplaces are putting these in uh, at a at a furious clip to support their employees and around town charging. Now, when you're going beyond your battery range, that that um, amount of time, that one hour that you quoted, that's actually substantially down from that point even today. And as more and more cars emerge with batteries that can take faster and faster charges, uh, the charging gear is is actually being deployed already in advance of those batteries being available. So you're going to see the charge rates uh, that the average stop drop to that 10 to 15 minute range uh, for most for most for most times when you're driving outside your battery range. I, I'm looking at your stock today, charge point up uh, about nine and a half percent. I'm wondering if there's any news. Uh, that's driving that? Because I know that David Kelly, who's an analyst over at Jefferies, initiated coverage on your company with a buy rating and also has a 12-month price target of $40. The stock is just under $35 a share. So anything in particular that you see driving the stock today? Um, I, don't, I don't know about today. We've made some recent announcements. We made a, uh, an announcement uh, on a uh, product line rollout uh, for the fleet segment uh, recently, and we also made an announcement on a, a, yet another announcement in the auto space, one with Mercedes-Benz this time, we're powering the, uh, the Mercedes uh, in-car navigation system and the Mercedes Me Mobile app from a charging perspective. So those, we're very happy with both those announcements, but nothing in particular over the last 24 hours. And I know that in Europe, you do have a presence there, I believe, but, but that, Market is pretty fragmented. Any plans to to make you know make a further push into uh, the European market? Yeah, we're that's a uh, an enormous focus for the company right now. We're investing uh, a, a tremendous amount of um, time and energy in establishing ourselves in that market. Uh, we've doubled our headcount in the last twelve months there, and are continuing to hire and and build out. 
uh, uh, capability, not only in sales, marketing, support, R&D, uh, everything across the board. We're serving about 16 countries now. Uh, we have uh, roaming partnerships that enable 175,000 or so uh, uh, public ports to be accessed through our mobile app. So it's a it's an enormous investment for the company. We're going to continue to do so. It's a uh, it's a, a huge opportunity there in Europe. So, Pasquale, when I think about charging stations and electric vehicles, I almost just think like a, a little bit of a chicken and the egg situation. Personally, I'm out in the suburbs. I couldn't even tell you where the nearest charging station for an electric vehicle is. And something like that uh, would actually be a concern for me in terms of going out and buying an electric vehicle. So as you guys right now are, are thinking of building out this network and building out that infrastructure to have these charging stations all around around the United States. How long do you think a rollout like that is going to take for someone like myself uh, in the suburbs of New York to say, oh, I know that there's charging stations only so many miles away from me? So uh, one thing about charging stations that's interesting is they were born in the era of a mobile app and uh, the mobile application uh, uh, phenomenon also born in, in the era of, of now it's very very uh, electronically um, capable electric vehicles. You'll see large screens in electric vehicles and full-time connectivity. What that means is your eyeballs are not the search engine for a charging station. They used to be the search engine for gas stations because that's they were gas stations were invented long before you had anything else but your but your eyes to to, to search for things and look for signage. If you download our mobile app, which is free to download and make an account. You can type into the uh, address field on the map any address you want across the United States, and I bet you you'll be very surprised at how many charging stations are available in your immediate surroundings. You never knew we were there because they're not designed to be conspicuous. They're designed to blend in because they're going to be virtually everywhere you park, uh, and they're going to have a speed, a maximum speed for filling your battery that's uh, appropriate for the natural parking duration at that site. So if you're at a grocery store, they're going to be kind of, um, you know, in areas of the parking lot. They're, they're, they're about the size of a parking meter and you might not even notice them if you didn't look. And if you're driving beyond your battery range, those are going to be a, a, a significantly more capable and more sizable units. And uh, But those still are often uh, associated with uh, a, a, a restaurant, a coffee shop, a convenience store, et cetera. Uh, and, and so Download the app and take a look. I bet you'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what's there unless we start looking for it, I guess. We don't need it quite yet. Kristen and I don't have our EV cars quite yet. Um, I know that your space is getting more crowded. I mean, you've got Wallbox, which is going to be going public through a, through a SPAC. Uh, Blink Charging is already public, as is your company. I know that you have this subscription service model, um, but how, how do you differentiate your uh, charging stations from others? Because from where I stand, you know, all I need is an electrical charge. So what makes your company different? Yeah, so we're, um, our business model is capital light. We don't own those chargers that you see, even though we, you think we own them. And, and that's, that's the beauty of this. We make it easy for drivers to find access. If there's a price set, pay for it. Uh, uh, all that interaction with the charger. But what we're doing is actually gluing together CapEx into one platform that and each one of those charges is essentially owned by the business that that you're visiting. It just is all part of the charge point network. Uh, so so um, in terms of what makes us different, um, we're not making money on uh, putting a margin on power. We're not uh, charging the driver subscriptions. We're charging the business a subscription to keep that charger on the charge point network and use all the network services that we provide. All right, Pasquale Romano, CEO of ChargePoint, thanks so much for being with us today. If you are wondering why car prices are sky high, just take a look at raw material costs. There's a new report out from Bank of America, which found that widespread inflation has led to a huge jump in the cost of raw materials. Here to break it down for us is John Murphy. He is senior automotive analyst at Bank of America Global Research. John, good to have you here. Let's break down these raw materials. Uh, what are we talking about? Aluminum, steel, what else? And, and just how high are these costs right now? Well, thank, thanks for having me. Um, you know, it's really interesting. You know, we saw a low in, in raw mats, uh, multi-year low, 
uh, in the beginning of, of, of last year. And since then, we've seen, as you kind of had up on the graphic there, almost a doubling in, in raw mat costs. And at the same time, um, you have average transaction prices in mix uh, that have been very strong for the industry, but are up and obviously nowhere near as much. So the issue here really is that, you know, if you look at raw mats versus um, the average transaction price, they were about 6% a year ago. Uh, they're now 11%. You know, normal is about 10%. So a year ago, they were really beneficial, but that's about a 500 basis point, um, you know, headwind through the value chain between the automakers and suppliers. So it's a real issue uh, that the automakers have not been able to push pricing through uh, completely on uh, just yet. And John, how long do you think this cost headwind is going to remain for some of these suppliers and in this space? So it, it seems like the bulk of this, because there's a little bit of a tape delay of, of the prices running through um, you know, P&Ls, uh, will hit in the second half of this year and the first half of next year. There will be a question, uh, you know, as, as to, you know, next year, if, if you can raise, if the automakers can maybe push pricing a little bit more uh, without denting demand too much. And will supply, particularly on the steel side, um, start coming on and ease some of the shortages uh, right now. But um, you know, as we all know, the chip shortage is keeping a lid on production at the moment. So next year, I would expect there to be a real spurt um, in auto production. So any incremental supply that would come on on the raw mat side may get eaten up pretty quickly. So I, I would I would think this headwind is going to be with us well into 2022, um, and we'll see how much you know, supply of the raw mats comes on relative to auto demand after that. As you know, being a, an automotive analyst, uh, we've got this chip shortage, this global chip shortage that continues to roil the industry. I know that Nissan's production this summer has been greatly affected. It's going to affect, um, it's going to idle output of three of Nissan's models, the Murano, uh, the Leaf, and the Maxima. Yet Volkswagen says it expects that chip shortage to ease in the third quarter, but it sees the bottlenecks continuing long term. Can you talk to us about what you're hearing? Yeah, so I mean, there there are varying degrees of, of when this will ease. I mean, it seems like the industry generally is talking about the second half of this year is when things ease. But you know, it, it sounds like it's 2022 when things start to normalize to some extent. You know, I, ironically, what the chip shortage has done is forced the auto industry to focus on its higher highest price, highest profit vehicles. Um, and what you're seeing, particularly at the at, at GM and Ford, is all time record profits as they're focused on less vehicles but the vehicles that make them money. Um, so as we go forward, this is the lesson um, or the experiment we've all been pushing for for decades for the automakers to try is maybe don't overproduce, um, you know, keep a, a tight lid on, on, on supply and focus where you make the most money. Um, and we're hoping that this discipline you know, is instilled in the industry in a way that it sticks around past the chip shortage into next year. We'll see, still a TBD. But when you see the automakers putting up record profit in a period when things seem a little bit um, wonky and not so great, it's pretty impressive. Um, and we hope they, they learn their lesson here. John, I'm wondering if there is any uh, particular automaker who's who's handling these raw material costs and, and this chip shortage better than others. And by that, I mean, did some of them perhaps buy up some of these materials well in advance, having you know foreseen that prices were going to go sky high? Is there somebody out there right now who's better positioned during this challenging time? It's a good question. It seems like there was a, a level of preparedness from the Japanese after they went through um, the direct issues with, with tsunami and the, and the chip um, supply issue there. Uh, so they seem to have had buffer stocks uh, that were more robust uh, than anybody else's on, on the planet. The Europeans seem to be a little bit better positioned. And then the, D, the D3, but you know, Gene and Ford, um, and, and then including Fiat Chrysler or Stellantis, um, have been a little bit less, uh, a little bit less prepared. Uh, the catch-up trade on that is I do think that GM and Ford um, are doing a very good job of allocating chips globally to North America to their most profitable products. So they are, you know, uh, you know, after being behind the ball, catching up quickly and doing a pretty good job with allocating chips well. So Japanese much better, Europeans kind of, you know, pretty good. Um, the D3 were behind, and now they're catching up quickly. All right, John Murphy, Senior Automotive Analyst at B of A Global Research. Great insights there. Thanks a lot for being with us.